Okay, so this is again the language of behavior, intervention tools and strategies, and I'm coming to you as a former teacher. I taught high school for 18 years. I've been in education for over 20 years. I'm now a school-based therapist. I got my um, Master of Social Work, so I do clinical work. Um, and I'm also the Director of Education Leadership for Talent Magnet Institute. And Josh, can you just give people a little background about what you're doing? Oh my goodness, yes. So, yes. Very similar to Charlie, keynote speaker. I was a former middle school administrator um, almost for a decade, which is crazy. And then now director of innovation for the Teach Better team. And of course, do a bunch of different things as author, podcaster, a lot of different <laughs> things that we won't go into right now. Um, Charlie, I'm going to keep adding people into the, into the participants. So, okay, great. Love all the folks that are in here. I know. I'm so glad you guys made it. This is so exciting. Um, Josh and I got together because we're writing a book together. We're so excited. So many people came to us and the work that we're already doing and they're like, you know what, we need some support with behavior issues specifically. And so Josh was doing work on the language of behavior already. So we got together and we thought, let's write a book together. So with Connect Ed, that is our publisher, we're going to be publishing it um, as soon as we can. We're handing it in and we're almost there. So that'll be coming to either at the end of the year or next year. Okay. So we're going to dive right in. We're going to talk about how to diffuse and reduce conflict. Now we only have a very short period of time. So we're just going to give you a few things, but let's dive into that. That's an issue that we're all dealing with. Okay. We want to teach you how to go from chaos, of course, to calm, to calm. We know that that's where we operate the best. So I want to think about um, how we're going to get there. So we're going to give you two strategies. The very first one is about check in yourself. You've heard a lot about this, but we're going to we're going to dive into that a little bit here, a little bit more, and we're going to talk about decoding behavior. So, I'm going to go back and stop sharing for just a second so we can share some information with you or just kind of talk a little bit with you. So, Josh is going to um kind of prompt about like the frustration behind your behavior. Let's go ahead, Josh. Yeah, for sure. So just as far as an administrator, I know that as far as student behavior goes, that may cause a lot of stress within your job and your title. And maybe it's just even as a teacher and as an educator. But for me, as an administrator, I was given three things within my tool belt, which was detention, ISS, and OSS. And as far as our data goes, what we were finding was that the behaviors weren't being solved at all. We were actually seeing an increase in the student discipline. And so for myself, I was extremely frustrated with my role, with the things that I had to my disposal and kind of the expectation too, as far as what an administrator is. So um, those were my experiences, which led me to this work, um, which we're going to talk about more today. But Charlie, would you share just a little bit about your experience as a teacher? Um, obviously, as administrator, I was kind of doing the punishment piece in a traditional model. Um, but what were some of your pain points as far as a teacher? Yeah. And a lot of people resonate with this still today. I felt like I wasn't supported. And I also felt like my opinion didn't count. Like I'm not the mental health expert. So my opinion doesn't matter. I remember feeling that way. And I did, I did have good insight and good input. So that is definitely something it, listen, if you guys, if that resonates with you as an educator right now, let us know. And we said this is for school leaders. You are a school leader. If you showed up here today, you are a school leader. And even if you're in your classroom, no matter what your role is, you're the leader of what you're trying to do. So I felt that way too. And the, the teachers we work with, they have the same complaints. Now, we're not saying that's accurate. We're not saying that admin doesn't value you. That's not what we're saying. We're saying that that is the pain point for sure. So let's go ahead. And um, if you want to share in here, yeah, it does resonate. I know a lot of people do say that to us. Um, yeah. but listen, I, we want to turn that around too. We want to have more of a connection to everybody feeling supported. Yeah. Okay. So I guess I should awesome. share, share the screen again. I'll do that. Yeah. I want to talk through just kind of the image of the trauma and brain development real quick. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah. So we're going to check ourselves. That was the first piece. Um, so just briefly, just looking at ourselves, because you know, a lot of times we talk about the students and the behavior and the trauma that may be caused uh, in their own background and experiences, but we don't really talk about as far as the educators. And um, I know like when I was going through the ACE testing, ACE testing myself, there were several things um, that came out of my experience in my family with school and why I didn't do very well in school and some of the behaviors that were shown um, with that. So just briefly, um, you know, just looking at this real quick. 
you know, a lot of us have experienced trauma and have gone through chronic stress through our, throughout our lives. And um, in just seconds, we're going to talk through, you know, what that does to the body. Um, Charlie's going to go through that. But I just want you to look at the graphic real quick. And I just want you to ask this question as far as what do you notice as far as, far as the ability to think and the use of cognition and the impact of trauma with the brain as far as this graphic specifically. And I'm just going to have you take a moment before Charlie dives into kind of the effects of trauma um, within our students, but then also, like I was talking about, with our adults. Yeah, feels like a lot, huh? Yeah, we forget ourselves sometimes, so. Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you guys have kind of thought about that. You're kind of reviewing what typical development looks like as a child and then developmental trauma and what that does. It's inverted, right? And so for you, you're bringing your, yeah, you absolutely go into survival mode for sure. For sure. For you, you bringing that in with you, I mean, from your own childhood. Now, this isn't new. You knew that. But there's a couple of things I want you to think about how your brain developed and held on to some of those, the, some of the trauma, right? So let's, let's kind of move forward through this so you can just kind of piece it together. So ACEs are those traumatic events that can have lasting effects. That could be anywhere from any kind of a, abuse that you experienced or witnessed. That could be from poverty. That can be from just a whole host of things that have gone wrong and created issues in your childhood. And then, and there's so much we could do with this, you all, but um, we're just, remember, just doing pieces here for you. Um, we know that affects our brain function and our health. So as a, an adult, imagine what you're carrying around, that load that you're carrying around. A lot of that is just unprocessed. It's just stuff that you've been carrying on and kind of adding to throughout your whole life that's now showing up in your professional life, your personal life, and all of that. Okay, so trauma is so physical. It's actually held in the body. It's triggered by the brain, right? So that stress, that um, the trauma is actually like neurological and it's, it's creating those neurons over time and it makes these associations and it's very subconscious, but our body remembers, even if something's happened to you, there's a lot of evidence going back even to uh, being an infant and in, in your utero that is having an effect, but our brain um, is triggered by that. You've heard that a lot and our body feels it. And so we respond, there's an emotional charge. And so when you're feeling your emotional charge, throughout the day and you're carrying that around all the time and you haven't processed that, of course, every little thing might, might bother you. Something you'd be, you'll be functioning fine. And then something might bother you. So again, that's not new information. You know that, but that does help explain a couple of things here. So I want to show you, I want to give you this visual here. Initially, if something happens to you, let's say you witness a car accident or you're in a car accident or you get some news or something right away, what can happen to you? It can cause exhaustion. Remember, this is physiological, it's in our bodies. Confusion, sadness, anxiety, agitation, numbness, initially when something happens to you. And if we don't do anything about that, if we don't help process that or kind of calm down and unravel that trauma or that experience, some of us can function better than others, but long-term, we might be tensing our muscles up and not even realizing it. We might have sleep disruption. We might startle easily. We might, yeah, like an infant does, it actually can show up as an adult, okay? Um, and distrust, we might have distrust. So think about your experience in distrust with other adults, maybe your boss, um, the system, right? The system. So that that kind of thing is, is short-term and long-term. So Josh, I'll hand it back over to you there. There's a lot there. Awesome. Hey, will you throw up the graphic real quick for the cycle? Yeah. Yes. So yeah. all of these images are going to be in the book and we're going to go through these a little bit more, but um, while this is up, I'm just going to talk through real quick. You know, she's, so Charlie's talking through like, as far as what ACEs look like in regards to the trauma potentially in our student. And obviously that's going to affect the learning might affect the body um, attendance rates. I mean, there's a lot of things that are connected due to our students are experiencing um, things at home or in utero. So what does that look like for, for us as an educator or for a leader um, I know for myself, you know, in, in tough times, I mean, there have been some stories, I'm not going to go into all of it, but that have been high stress, chronic stress within the job that, you know, I become less engaged in school activities. Um, I know with staff members, they've gone through just traumatic experiences and it's led to medical conditions that are chronic. Um, it's depression, drug use, 
um, suicidal thoughts. Um, I know for some, you know, if you're looking at the ACE testing, um, four or more ACEs, you have 25 times more likely to attempt suicide, um, which is staggering. And, you know, staff members that it was hard for them to even get out of bed due to the anxiety after experiencing such um, trauma in their own lives. So um, I don't know if you're comfortable, but if you are, um, if there's any ways that this has affected you and your performance or behavior um, in the past, obviously you're more than welcome to put in the chat. Um, but I think this is something that's occurring more often than we realize. I know for myself, it's it's definitely occurred um, in my role and having to kind of work through that as an educator to make sure that I'm the best person um, for the job. I'm going to go through real quick, Charlie, as far as um, kind of this cycle um, of un unresolved student behavior. Earlier, I talked about kind of the traditional way of th doing things as far as punishment, you know, with the detentions, uh, ISS and OSS. And for us on our campus, we really were trying to find a different way of doing things. And I am not the expert in that. I was absolutely trying to see seek out more strategies, techniques to work with students to, to make sure that that wasn't reoccurring as far as the student behavior, but then also like the data, like I was telling you, was off the chart. It was only increasing. So what we did was we created what was called the RATS team, which is <laughs> probably not my favorite term, but what it was was relational relationship action team. And just a brief history real quick, um, as time is ending quickly, um, what we were trying to do is we were just trying to get away from the traditional discipline methods. So I'm um, trying to get away from that, learning more and really looking at how we could really use it as a way of not only learning, but implementing new strategies. And if it worked, keeping it, and then also sharing it out to others. And I really didn't want it to be a top-down initiative. I didn't want it to be something where I, as the admin, said, you must do this. It was really just trying to find like-minded folks to get together and to learn and to try things out. So um, it's very much a, an open-minded space um, for us to learn. And honestly, we started like with seven folks at the beginning of the school year. By the end, we had almost half the staff of 100. So um, it was one of these things that grew, but it was mostly because it was peer to peer, not like I said, a top down initiative. Which is awesome. And when I heard about it, you all, what I loved about it is that they tried new strategies. They had a system about it and they had to be open-minded and try new things. And we're going to share a strategy right now with you that they did that worked really well. So Josh, you're going to explain this push-in model. Now you've yeah. heard of push-in before you all, but this was unique. I thought that was, was neat. Go ahead. You explain it. It's great. Of course. So one of the biggest pain points, we talked about this earlier, was just the idea of like, we don't have the resources of the staff to do a lot of the things that we want to do as far as some of these alternative um, discipline models. One of these was uh, something we learned from St. Louis of all places. Um, and we took it and we stole it, which was this push-in model. And really what it was, was it was to help teachers because what we found was teachers were really feeling similar to what Charlie was talking about. It was like, I don't have control of this, right? I have a student that's acting out and then I send them to the office, the front office, you know, takes care of it, but I am, now disconnected from the process. And a lot of times it was like low level incidents that were occurring in the classroom. And what we found with the data piece was that we were losing thousands of minutes outside of the classroom for things that were disruption in the class or disrespect in the classroom, very low level um, infractions. So what we decided to do was when something was going on um, in the classroom that was disruptive, they could call the front office and ask for a push in. And what that meant was that someone was gonna relieve the teacher. So it could be an admin, counselor, coach, people that were trained in regards to this uh, de-escalation, but then also to be able to take over class real quick for like five minutes. And so what you're seeing on the screen here is just the, the push in model questions. And there's literally the teacher taking the student out of class, out of the environment real quick, taking a walk and just ask them, hey, what's going on today? How are you feeling? Um, you know, really kind of going through as far as what they can do to help make the student successful in that class. Um, because a lot of times there's obviously something behind the behavior. Uh, maybe it was they broke up with their boyfriend or girlfriend before class. Maybe it was they got into an argument. You know, there, there's a lot of times there's something every time, really. There's something beneath the behavior. And then, of course, the last thing is just going over the expectations and, and getting that agreement, that verbal agreement, that they're going to be able to get back in the classroom and be successful. And what we found was that with this push-in model, we literally took thousands of minutes out of ISS, out of discipline, and allow them to be with the person building a stronger relationship, but it's the content expert. And that's what we really wanted. Um, so we got to see grades improve, test scores improve, because obviously the students that are disruptive are the ones most likely that need to be in the classroom with that content expert. 
Mm -hmm. And this was what I liked about it was a team approach. There's some training around it. Of course, we can't get to all that right here because there's not enough time. No. But everybody was involved in it and it helped the teacher keep the kid in the classroom. And so there, there sure. wasn't that instructional time that was lost, which it's more stress on everybody when that happens. And we're not sending kids to teach or uh, we're not sending them to school counselors saying, fix the kid, right? We, we empowered the teacher. I loved that part. And so there's a little bit more, but just to get started, like you guys can start thinking about this just by asking these questions. You could take a picture of the screen if you want um, to get started too. So, all right. Any, anything else you want to say about that, Josh? No, I think uh, the biggest thing was just the logistics, looking at who was off and who was able to go in for the push-in model. Um, but I think it was something that we found extremely um, beneficial for our kids, our teachers to love the idea of, of building that relationship and get to know their kids at a deeper level. Yeah, there's a lot of evidence that supported it too. So, okay. So we'll give you more strategies here. There's, there's more to come. Um, the other thing is consider your environment. Now, Oftentimes when we set up classrooms, we set up our, our offices, our buildings, we're thinking of other people. But I want you to think about what it's like for you to walk in your own space. What's that like for you? Look around. How does it look? How does it feel? What does it do to you? Do you notice an emotional charge, the way it's set up? Or is there a space you're walking into a lot that gives you an emotional charge? Think about where that's coming from. And by the way, you don't always know. So just listen to your body more and think about where you're engaging. That's important. And um, what can you alter, if anything, or what? how can you manage that? That's another thing. The other thing I want you to think about is what will help you do your job better? What would help you do this better? And sometimes you can actually go and ask for what you need, and sometimes you can meet your own need. But what we want from you all is to just enjoy your life, enjoy your professional life and your personal life. So we just want you to free up some of that energy by just um, thinking about these questions about yourself. And then who's your dream team? Who can you go to when you need something? Who can you go to when you need a laugh? There's lots of different people on your dream team. There certainly was for mine and there still are. I call upon them all the time. Just some things to think about here, okay? And we also gave you a well-being workbook. Sometimes we can use this with kids and we look at it, we're like, oh, this is more for kids. But there are actually two pages in there, page two and eight. This was the handout or this was the freebie that Josh has. And Josh, maybe you can, if, if there's time, maybe we'll do this in a little bit. But we can put the link to the speakers page. It's the thrivingeducator.org forward slash speakers. The workbook is the very first freebie that Josh has. And it gives you some like some goal setting things. But really at the end, it's about that top-down approach, just thinking about what, what am I getting at? What am I looking for? There you go. Josh put it in the chat. It's free, totally free. You can download the whole workbook, but this page particularly, I want you to go straight to in your role. What is it that you want for yourself? And how do you know you're going to get there? What will you see? What will you hear? What will you feel? This is what I do in therapeutic practice all the time. We need to be able to do that for ourselves in order to function better. And um, I think that's, I know that there's a lot more we could say about that, but I'm going to go ahead and um, move forward in this and we'll throw the links in there later too. Okay. So Josh, you're going to talk about like just wrapping this part up so we can get to the next piece. Yeah. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because we only got a couple of minutes, but I just want you to think about just kind of with this checking of ourselves, um, how will we reduce conflict? You know, I always talk about being a window, not a mirror, right? Allowing the behaviors to go through you and not mirroring what the student's doing, right? If they're yelling, if they're close to proximity, and there's a lot of things that you don't want to model as far as the, the communication. So how will you reduce conflict and how will this prevent baby issues moving forward? So um, obviously you gotta meet your own needs, but you also want to be de-escalating the strategies uh, with the kids. And then also, you know, kids and staff feed off of your own energy and your mood. So if you're talking calmly, if you're, at their own level. I mean, there's a lot of things that you can do as far as strategies to make sure that you're allowing them to replicate your energy and mood. And then of course, managing the demands of the job and of course, finding joy in your profession and your personal life, which is so important. Um, obviously we could talk a lot about this, Shelly, um, but we don't have time, but this is super important for yourself um, to make sure that you're putting things in, in place for your own well-being, and that'll help the longevity of your career. Mm -hmm. We're giving you permission right now to kind of think a little bit 100%. more about yourself. Yes. Yes. Okay. So decoding behavior. Again, I wish we had a lot more time for this. This is something that Josh and I love. This chapter in our book is 
so long. <laughs> so long. Um, <laughs> it took a long time. Okay, but so we'll round this up quickly. In the chat, I want you to think about behavior. Behaviors you're seeing in your building, your classrooms, your buses, your hallways, your organization, your teams. All right, what do they look like, sound like, feel like? What do those behaviors look like, sound like, and feel like? Put that in the chat or at least think about it. Think about what that's doing, okay, when, you, when you're observing it, what those behaviors are like. And we wanted to give you a visual of something, so a little strategy or a tool that you can use when you're thinking about this. It is different for every kid. It is. So what yes. are we hearing mostly? What are we, what are we hearing a lot of? What are we seeing a lot of? What are we feeling like when this is happening? And we're hearing a lot of the similar like patterns too. Okay. So this is a, something that we needed to come up with. Yeah. I don't get this. Yeah. I hear that a lot of sighs, disrespect, no regard for each other's feelings. Yeah. Um, but we wanted something really simple to give us kind of clarity so that we can look at the issue holistically. We want to look at the whole kid. We already know that that's important to do. So how do we do that? Well, we wanted to simplify it. We like visuals and we put a lot of these, all of these are in the book. We threw a lot more in there too. Um, but identifying the manifestations of trauma and behavior is going to help us understand it. So we have a little tool to go back to. And Josh, did you want to say a little bit more about this yes. piece here? Yeah. Yes, I do. Yeah. Okay. So just the three questions, what happened? What are they trying to tell me? What do they need as far as a resource? Right. So a lot of times I know, especially in secondary, sometimes they look like they're grown people. They can drive, they're married, they have kids, but really they're young people, right? And they, we can't assume that they have the skills to, to work through adverse situations. So behavior is a language. They're telling us something. We need to look at what happens. What are they trying to tell us in that communication as far as the behavior? And then what, of course, is behind that, that they can get some additional resources from either us, a counselor, or some additional resources outside of school. So if we have this kind of as our framework moving forward with every behavior um, that are that's undesirable, I think that's going to help us quite a bit moving forward to get at the root of the problem versus just reacting to the behavior that we don't like. Yeah. And I'm seeing stuff in the chat. Yeah, you guys, it's so hard when we're trying to help them and they don't want to be helped. That's really hard on us too. That is, is triggering. I, I hate that word. You know why? Because a lot of people roll their eyes at it these days. So I like to say emotionally charged because that's exactly what's yeah. happening. Okay. It's yeah. a, the emotional yeah. charge is a re result of what's triggered. Okay. So how's that going to yeah. reduce conflict for us if we notice uh, or have those questions really is, you know what, we'll be able to identify what's going on. And we'll think of that big picture, but it's a simple way to kind of give us a stop sign in our brain. It's actually another strategy. We teach kids who are impulsive, sometimes us too, as adults, imagine a stop sign in, in our brain. When we have these questions, this small little framework, it gives us something to do. It gives us something to do. Yeah. Kids are throwing their chairs. They're saying, I don't care. Uh, I'm not going to listen to you. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff that they're saying that's really tough to deal with. So if we have that little framework we can just start with what happened you know what what can i do here what do they need then it gives us something to do all right so we're going to wrap this up we're going to wrap this up and remember we're going to check check yourself we're going to decode behavior we gave you some strategies there we want you just to remember the effect of trauma is on the brain and your function. The initial, there are initial effects and there are long-term effects that can really hurt us. So we have to be cautious about ourselves. And there's a cycle of unresolved student behavior that goes on there. That's part of it. And the strategies we gave you, the push-in model, well-being essentials, that's that workbook, the cycle of unresolved student behavior framework, and that identifying manifestations of trauma method. Okay. So Josh, go ahead and, and wrap this up with the resources. This is just that workbook awesome. that just reiterates that. Yes. Yeah. Oh, perfect. So um, we didn't talk about this earlier, but we are creating a new podcast that's coming out hopefully about the end of the month of October. So um, like a month from today, actually. <laughs> so the language of behavior, look out for that. Um, it's the two of us, um, myself and Charlie Peck, uh, as we're going to be diving into this weekly as far as you know, some strategies and trying to give you some free resources moving forward.